Welcome to the 53rd episode of Space Rocks Uplink. Um, thanks so much to everyone who's joining us from around the world. And uh, Mark, what a pleasure it is to see you. Well, I've seen you more than 53 times, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I wondered if it's worthwhile for us to begin the show um, with a bit of an introduction to what Space Rocks and indeed ESA is all about for people that might just be seeing us for the very first time. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm Mark McCorkran. I'm the Senior Advisor for Science and Exploration at the European Space Agency. And that means a lot of things in terms of trying to communicate the science and technology and future plans that we have at the European Space Agency to a wide range of audiences. Some of those might be internal ones, um, you know, our own staff contractors. Some will be talking to other scientists to politicians, delegates, and so on. But one of the big things we have to do, of course, is talk to the general public. Um, and we do that in a variety of ways, many of them online, um, sharing images, sharing videos. But the thing we decided to do, you and I, some, some several years ago now, is turn that into something live where we could bring together scientists, engineers, astronauts, musicians, writers, poets, filmmakers, actors, all sorts of people involved in the kind of, let's call it the broader form of the creative arts, whether that's exploring the universe or exploring a musical universe, um, and run live events. And uh, we've, we've done that a couple of times. And in fact, one of our guests this evening was uh, the headline act at our very first uh, live event in 2018. Um, and the other guest, um, we've connected in the past on doing outreach things together. I mean, so there's a bit of a history with our guest this evening. Um, but of course, during the pandemic, we've been doing it online uh, through Uplink. So, you know, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have uh, these two guests on this evening. They're already connected to, to what we've been doing, but it'd be great talking to them. Indeed. And, and, and of course, you know, I guess so much about what Space Rocks is, is about that intersection of science and the arts, you know, um, because they do interact with each other, they do inspire each other and the door goes both ways. And and for people that might be joining us from, let's say the space or indeed ESA side of things, I wonder if we should do a bit of intro on what Frost are all about. Yeah. So yeah, it's probably no mystery from uh, previous shows we've done and, and things I've said online that I'm a big fan of progressive rock, uh, along with all sorts of other music, but somehow that's right, always been at the center of my uh, musical genre. And I came across this band nearly 15 years ago, Frost, Frost with an asterisk at the end. Uh, and at that point, you know, this is the band of Jem Godfrey originally, and John Mitchell, our other guest uh, uh, this evening, worked on the band right from the beginning. They've been very well of, of Frost, uh, along with Nathan King today. Um, and as I said, we've involved Frost and the musicians in Frost in various projects. So in 2016, uh, 2014, when um, the Philae probe landed on Comet 67P as part of the Rosetta mission, we made a short movie using some of the images taken by Philae, and it was set to a track uh, from one of Frost's albums, a, a, a song called Saline. Um, and then as I said, in 2018, in our first London um, uh, Space Rocks event, John's band, Lonely Robot, it's his personal project, but he had a band with him. Uh, they were the headline act for that very first show. So the connections are there. And uh, and we know, as we'll talk this evening, that Frost are very interested in technology, musical technology, but also space technology. And the reason I have a TARDIS behind me is because I know that Jim is a bit of a Whovian. In fact, I think he owns his own TARDIS. So, uh, Let's see if we can chat to him about that. All right. Well, uh, a, a fantastic intro. And uh, well, let's, uh, without further ado, bring them in through time and space into our <laughs> chat room. John and Jem, how are you doing? Are you receiving OK? Loud and clear. Yes. Hello. Hello. Fantastic. Well, um, good so, to see you both. Yeah. Wonderful to uh, to be joined by you guys. And um, and thanks for making the time. Yeah, you know, we always start off with a with a broad question to kick things off before we go into the outer reaches of space, as it were. I mean, Jim, I mean, starting with you, um, why don't we start with the music of Frost and how is it influenced perhaps by the, the worlds of science or indeed science fiction? Do, do those two things interact when, when, when Frost music comes together? Yeah, I think they do. I think, I think it's all to do with imagination, isn't it? And I think ideas and a couple of mics, it's all quite a quite a measured procedure so I think yeah well, I, there's definitely there's definitely a correlation um and I mean I've had an interest obviously since I was 
little anyway. So it's kind of it's 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 part of who I am really, the the science and the science fiction. Well, um, uh, please go ahead, Mark. Yeah, well, and just hand it off to John, who we know, you know, you know, you're a you're a big fan of science fiction, and uh, we've had lots of discussions over the last year, of course, about many many things. But you know, where did that start for you? What was the first thing that you tripped over? I mean, I think I mentioned in the intro, Jem, you've got a uh, a TARDIS somewhere, whether you still have it, but you have had, and you've got some Cybermen heads kicking around in the studio somewhere, I think. Uh, but John, what was the first thing that brought you into that sort of um, imaginary universe? Probably actually Disney's The Black Hole. Um, I, in, when I was, I would have been about four years old when Star Wars first came out. So I'm told that I went to see, it's difficult to remember that sort of period of time, but you know, obviously most sort of people of our generation, you know, are sort of very much fans of, episode four i can't actually i don't have a, a you know it's funny i remember falling in the thames when i was a kid i don't remember when the first time i saw star wars i remember uh, seeing um empire strikes back but the first film i think that really or the first sort of exposure to science fiction that really sort of that i really resonated with me was the uh, yeah disney's the black hole which is a very strange film for disney because you know certainly back then they were synonymous with very sort of fluffy family pictures and like you know, and this was altogether a different thing. And not only that, it had a very sinister soundtrack, which, uh, you know, stuck in my mind as being really one of the most uh, atonal pieces of music ever written, which of course is the work of uh, um, our, our great sort of mentor, John Barry, as it were. So that was the first uh, sort of, yeah, that was the first sort of delving into the, and it, it's a very dark film for somebody of, of my age to have watched as well. <laughs> it's kind of like Dante's Inferno at the end, and it's kind of, <laughs> yeah it's it's uh yeah but that's you've got to start as you mean to go on really don't you so that... yeah. I have a completely silly anecdote actually about um, Star Wars Episode Four because I'm you, you like to say of our generation I'm afraid I'm a bit older. Um, so 1977 when the film came out, um, we went on a school trip. I was 16. We went on a school trip to Wales, and I had years before my dad had brought home a copy uh, of the Yes album, and I had no context to place it in other than it was a cassette, and it went in this mono cassette player, and I listened to it sort of obsessively. But I had no idea that that band were doing anything. I mean, it just was I was so far out of the world of music that I just took, I thought, that's great. Didn't think about buying anything else. Until we were on this school trip, so you had the NME or uh, Melody Maker. There was a big spread about going for the one which came out that year. And I thought, well, that's, that's you know very interesting. There's a band. I can go and buy a record. But in the corner in that issue was a little picture in the bottom corner of a page of something that looked like a spaceship. And it said, you know, big film coming out in the UK soon. It's been a hit, a sort of sleeper hit in America coming to a screen near you. And that was the first time anybody had heard about Star Wars in the UK, same year. So uh, prog and sci-fi in that same melody. I don't, I'd love to find a copy of it, but uh, somewhere yeah. in the deep past. Yeah. Well, this, this is the thing that was in, you know, um, whenever a conversation veers into this area, I'm always reminded of the, um, the iconic intro to the original rod serling twilight zone it's like you're going on a journey through sight and sound i mean i mean jim um as a man who um reputedly owns his own tardis i mean how big is that intro to doctor who i mean for me um it gives me chills every single time i listen to it yeah it's 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 i would say possibly the most iconic piece of electronic music ever written i would say i mean i think um Ron Grainer wrote it, and Delia Derbyshire, the Radiophonic Workshop, realised it was the word. Mm-hmm. And just, it, it's a timeless piece of music. And I think it's the same that John was saying about the John Barry thing. And also, interestingly, actually, because just just a side note about how the black hole was really the first thing he remembers. For me, actually, because I'm a couple of years older than him, the first thing I really, I mean, I've, I've the same thing. I don't really remember. Star Wars was just kind of there, like you know, cheese on toast. <laughs> and I think. The first thing I remember was a badge that my brother came back with, which, which said um, Blade Runner coming this summer. Mm. And of course, that's another massive uh, film where the music is so intertwined with the, the with the, you know, the, 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 the cinematography and the, and, the, and the whole theme of it and the way it looks and the way it is. And I think that was a massive influence. But going back to Doctor Who, it's the same sort of thing. It's kind of, you know, they 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 put you in a place. I mean, there's nothing like it. Even now, you hear that just even that first two seconds of the of the Doctor Who theme tune, and you you've suddenly you've got you know there's 55 years of imagery in your, in my head anyway. And for me, it was a very um, 
a very emotionally charged thing because my parents split up when I was eight and it was quite a bad divorce. I mean, it was very bad divorce. And so what would happen would be amidst all this carnage that was going on on Saturday afternoons, I was, I was away, you know, I could be in this place and away from all this thing that was going on. And I think it's kind of, for me, it has a particularly loaded relevance because of that. And, but I think just aside from that, it's just an incredible piece of music. It's, it's, it, you know, I think pretty much everybody on the planet knows a version of it, you know, and it's, it's kind of, it's just a, a massive, massive thing for me. That's that theme tune. Hmm. So, so Jam, you mentioned that you mentioned your brother, Simon, and, and, you know, again, thinking about the timing, it was sort of probably a bit more reasonable that somebody of my age would be a prog fan when they grew up, but it probably wasn't that cool when you guys were growing up. So uh, what, what brought the pair of you into this? I mean, and I don't want to pigeonhole you at all because of course you've both done a vast number of other musical things, but you know, why that music at that time? Because Simon's, a, let's call him broadly a prog musician as well. So, and you're in a band free fall early on and that kind of came back later on uh, as you did your separate things with Tiny Fish and Frost. Um, again, I mean, actually, really, it's, it's the Doctor Who connection. I think it's kind of, it, it, it was always, um, the thing about that particular program is it, it absolutely normalised being different. You know, well, that was so brilliant about it because it was it was just, you could be an alien, you could be, you know, any gender, you could do whatever you want. And it was just kind of, and there was just this character who wasn't even a human being doing these mad things and going, well, I can do this because I can. And, and it was really emboldening for me as a, as a, as a youngster because I was very shy as a kid. And so I kind of had this sort of, it was like every every Saturday I'd get this character that I could relate to, you know, and I didn't really, do, I wasn't sporty. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in sort of in those sort of crowds at school that, that, that were very cool. I was always the kind of sort of kid over in the corner. And I actually quite liked it because I knew that I, the things I liked were different and it was okay to be different because I had this reference point on the telly every week. So, and I think that, informed my whole decision to do what I do for a living because you know you are by definition of being a musician a performing musician you're standing up on stage and the spotlight's on you you know and, and you have to be sort of you have something just have to have something to say so yeah I think I think it was in our household it was never a regret that we were we were kind of into these sorts of things these escapist things it was we were proud of it we were quite pleased with it mm. that's a, it's a fascinating perspective certainly because you know I I mean just I think that I'm obviously a little biased as I know Mark is as well, but do you think there's something perhaps about progressive music that predisposes it um, to kind of like, you know, attracting um, the kinds of, you know, people that do perhaps not fit in elsewhere? Because I mean, just like in terms of, you know, musical genres, you know, it occupies obvious border territory with rock metal, like all these other sorts of things. Um, and yet I do kind of feel like it, it, above all else, perhaps like Doctor Who, it courts eccentricity. I mean, almost by its definition, it defies expectation. And I think that's why you have that incredible variety of music, but also the incredible variety of people that are that are making it as well. Well, I mean, probably John's probably better asked because he's, he's, he's the three lonely robot, but it's kind of a four lonely <laughs> robot. Actually, so I do apologize. But I think, you know, if, as I'll just quickly, before I hand over to him, I just, you know, Star Wars normalized it massively, I think, in the 70s. It was cool. You know, it was cool to have fly on a spaceship and, and, and fight monsters and stuff it was kind of it, it you know it, it went from being something that that didn't work to suddenly being very very mainstream and i think that kind of again was was um uh, you know it, it 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 brought people out of their shells a bit thinking this is okay this is this is this is an adventure this is this isn't this isn't some weird people in the corner but john sorry I'm... no it's not... i mean i it was the question is that did you think that they're the, the you know why progressive rock and I mean, the, the connection between progressive rock and there are probably quite a lot of sci-fi fans who like progressive rock. Was that, was that the, yeah. that, that was the intimation? Well, um, yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, I use the word it is, I suppose you could argue that progressive rock is kind of a bit nerdy if we're going to use that word. By the way, that's not a bad word anymore. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> word now. That's been destigmatized. But Pride, pride. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's funny that, you know, because you know a lot of science fiction requires you to have quite a, an open mind and and you know to be quite you know sort of it's not like i, I always got this definition of uh, films you know um you know there's a lot of what i call pink films like films in like pink you know like like rom-coms and things and, it, and all the dvd cases are always colored pink and uh <laughs> yeah, they don't require much imagination of course then you get sort of like uh 
you get into uh, you know sci-fi. It does require, and I'd say the same is true of progressive rock music. It does require a, a degree of sort of open-mindedness. But then the funny thing I've found since being involved in the wide, wide world of prog is that actually uh, some of the most closed-minded people do occupy the territory, and there are a lot of people that you know there are there is a sort of uh, sort of a triumvirate of things that need to occur in, in, in the songs they listen to in order for them to accept it wholeheartedly, namely the Mellotron um, and, the, you know, the Moog, there has to be a Moog solo and, and a bit of Hammond organ maybe or something. Um, and I remember my, the first time I went, I went to Progfest in Los Angeles in 1997 and I remember watching a band, we were there um, just doing, yeah, we were there, with Arena and I think I remember watching this guy he came to the front of the stage and sat down cross-legged in white robes with a sitar at the front of the song. I thought, for instance, when we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, it is It is a genre that can take itself rather seriously. But then, you know, you could say the same of a lot of science fiction fans. You know, they are predispos pre predisposed to a, a real... You know, this stuff is important to the... To the and I suppose that's, that level of passion is... is is not you know because we can eat you know it isn't musical wallpaper and science fiction isn't isn't wallpaper in terms of you know it's it's there are people that are you know passionately passionately engaged in these things which is of course where the film galaxy quest comes from mm -hmm. that is you know you could equally make that film about progressive rock fans in fact why don't we do that it's a brilliant idea <laughs> i can't believe no one's ever thought of it <laughs> I, I wonder i wanted to pick up on that because you know i've been to lots of gigs and i've been to a, a fair few science fiction conventions partly as a speaker most recently and it's kind of weird i think half the audience get it half the audience realize that what you're doing on stage whether you're an actor talking about being in a, in a, a film or you're a musician playing that particular piece of music half the audience understand that's just a piece of your life you have a you know a bigger world behind you but the other half don't seem to get that you know they, they do want to ask questions about so in that episode 13 of such and such a series you picked up the pen the wrong way around and you see the actors just roll their eyes yeah so i'm I, really I, I, Shatner, particularly. Well, yeah well yeah I've, I've i have walked i've been on stage with william shatner at one of these things and he's an interesting fellow let's say uh I, I, let's put it this way much better to be on stage with uh george takei um uh, shatner's interesting um, but but I just wondered how it is for you guys as well. I mean, here we are. We're talking about you know a piece of your lives, the music, um, to some extent, the science fiction stuff. But it, does that get boring at some point? You know, talking about that. I mean, is it is it like an artist constantly talking about his painting rather than painting? Um, I, I'm just curious because you know we've done lots of these interviews, and you, I know you've done loads of interviews for for day and age. At some point, it just sort of get just start washing over you, and you say, yeah, same questions all the time. There has been a bit of repetition, but one thing we kind of went into was we before before we started all these things, John and I and Nate actually, we just had a strategy of you know don't don't explain too much, you know because if you and the people would say what's that song about what's that song what that when you said that in that lyric what does that lyric mean and you have to kind of go well, what do you think it means because I think <laughs> otherwise if it's too definite you're losing half the bit it's, it's got to be there has got to be a slightly fantastical element because again you know with lyrics. If you can read your own things into them, then you sort of own them and it, it feels more personal. If someone just goes, well, it's about a gigantic moon dog with three heads and a packet of crisps. And they go, oh, right, I thought it was about my girlfriend. I no, no, it's not about that. <laughs> and they go, oh, right. And then you've kind of lost somebody in that respect. So it's it's sort of, and also the songs, I mean, I don't even think between the three of us in the band, the songs necessarily mean the same thing because, you know, we're, we're, we're all individual people and we have different life experiences. Um. Yeah, I, it, it, I mean, the other thing is, it, it, it's, it, we can't complain about talking about ourselves. It's an honour to do this. <laughs> there are many, many people that don't get a chance to do it. And if we ever sort of went, you know, you know, interviews, I think we're doing the wrong job because it's it's part of it. And, you know, and we're, I think we're very well. I'm, we're, we're, we are. I'll speak for all three of us. We're very grateful for what we for what we do. We are indeed. I think it's very much down, like Jem says, it's down to, you know, a lot of those, the questions that we did ask, I mean, the standard issue one was... Uh, so about these drummers then, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, the drummers, here we go. <laughs> but, you know, then we did have this, you know, we had this, um, you know, it's, you'll get um, people who have done a lot of preparation for the, you know, for the questions they're going to ask you. We had some fantastic questions. Yeah. You know, and, and they kind of really caught us off guard and it kind of makes you think about, 
you know, I mean, a lot of these songs when we started writing them, you know, originally when I sort of started, uh, you know, the certainly ones that, you know, I, I was involved in, the, you know, the writing of it, you start scribbling down a lyric and you think you know what it's going to be about. And then it's sort of, you know, you, your subconscious starts doing something else, you know, um, and it is your subconscious when you're going at that speed, you're not even sure. And it's kind of, it's an interesting process to sort of come back to it and realise, hang on, yeah, no, that sounds kind of... And it's it's kind of fun. It's it's odd sometimes looking back at words when you when you've written them and you kind of you do feel like you're you know looking at them from a third person perspective. It's very strange, but like I said, you there was this one guy and I don't want to. Well, no, it doesn't matter. He, he kind of uh, he didn't do any preparation and we had this podcast with him and he just uh, <laughs> and he just halfway through. He's, I'm just waiting to see where this interview is going. <laughs> <laughs> well, if only there was some way of planning ahead. <laughs> to navigate this interview. <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned that, John, because I was just waiting to see how this interview... I'm joking. <laughs> but, it's funny uh, about the drummers. The drummer thing was quite interesting because when, it, when we started doing the interviews, we were saying, it turned out the street drummers and we go, well, we met this cow when the cows was riggers and I might have be told Tom as well and we met the bar and then we came back we're a big fan and John met Robert. But they were going, yeah, there's three drummers. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, all right. Hey, quite many... enough press already. <laughs> now, but, but Jem, you've you've gone a bit meta because you run your own podcast as well now, right? And uh, I listen I listened to one of the episodes this week, the the most recent one with. Um, I'm going to see if I can get the na- pronunciation of the name right. Right, JJ Jenkalik. Let's see if I can listen to it right. Yeah, I'm afraid not. Jen Chalik? It's Jen Chalik, yeah, exactly. Jen Chalik, indeed. There you go. No, I mean, I listened to the episode and then I thought, I'm not going to remember how to pronounce this. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I was terrified. <laughs> um, who was with The Art of Noise and, uh, and um, you know, did an awful lot of sampling stuff. Now, of course, that the technology side is, as you mentioned, is very important as well. I think in a... I think it, it seems to be a, partly a hobby, partly because it's something that's interesting in and of itself to you. I mean, you've got a lot of keyboards there, and I know, and as John does as well, and you go through a lot of gear. Is it something which, you know, is there, a, sometimes photographers get a little bit too obsessed by the gear, or Alex and I as cyclists, right? Yeah, look at all the shiny bits I've got on my bike. Well, are you riding it? Well, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm polishing the shiny bits. Uh, I know that's not true in your case, but I mean, where does that oh, sort no, it of... Is. Gear, is it? Okay. You're a gear, <laughs> you're a gear head, a gear obsessive. <laughs> yeah. Is this, is this in regard with the podcast or, or? Well, no, I was just interested because indeed in that podcast, you've been talking to people who are similarly gearheads, it seems to me, at least at some level. I mean, JJ didn't even call himself a musician, really, right? And yet he's clearly musical, but he's not a trained musician. Any but neither are you, right? I mean, not, that's not your, you know, not kind of classically trained musician at all. So said, sorry, sorry. Go, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just saying, with Jay, I sort of sense with JJ there was a slight anger about that actually, the non-music yeah. because he he did keep coming back to it every now and then, and yeah. and and I think maybe he doesn't realise it. Maybe there's an insecurity there with him about that because I think he is a musician. You know, he did yeah. he did. I remember there was a I don't know whether many people will see this, but in the UK there was a, used to be a program called Whistle Test in the 80s, which was a brilliant brilliant program, and there was one performance that the Pet Shop Boys did of Opportunities. And they had two fair lights and they had a big set, a big screen behind them with page R, which is the sequencing thing on it. And basically there's uh, Chris Lowe's in the corner with, with his keyboard, Neil Tennant's struggling with an emulator. He can't play it, but he's doing his best. But this, it's, it's a one-off version. It's just this absolutely banging, banging version. It's the best version of that song I've ever heard. And JJ did all the programming for it. Mm. <clears throat> so he is a musician, you know, and it, but he sort of refutes that. So I find that quite an interesting sort of tension within him. And then again, I suppose the art of noise, that was Gary Langham as well, wasn't it? Yeah, and Ann Dudley. Yeah. So I mean I don't necessarily know that Gary Gary Lang Gary Langham is is he's a he, he comes from a production purely a production. Well this was this was, was the thing that JJ with that just quickly paraphrasing the, the podcast, but basically he was saying that, that JJ brought all the kind of attention to detail with the sampling. Anne would be the musician and, and Gary would be the one that stuck it all through a desk and made it all sound and put the fair lights with compressors and made it all sound amazing. So they all had a role to play and he was saying it was the diversity of the three of them and the tension of that, using that word again, was what made the creativity what it was because there were three completely different points of reference. Yeah, I, I realise also in the in the podcast, he didn't talk very much, well, talked a bit about Trevor Horn, but but not a lot about Paul Morley. And I'm still struggling to quite realise what Paul Morley did. But, you know, but that's maybe not fair. I mean, it's kind of part of the, the art of it, right? The, the, the agent provocateur. But then they split apart at that point. I and mean, they must, you didn't go into that in much detail. But anyway, curious stuff. But Alex. Um, so, um, so I, I guess, you know, just sort of um, really uh, probably putting my foot in it in a, in a way, uh, because I, I don't want to... Um, 
you know, kind of, you know, spin this around. But, you know, one of the, the frequent laments um, of people who I speak with, not just musicians, but specifically um, producers, you know, and of course, both of you do that as well. It, it's just that um, it, it's a general complaint about pop music, um, you know, just because, you know, there's a frequent kind of feeling that at some stage, because we're talking about, you know, music from the 80s and so on, just like, you know, absolute chart hits, where, um, yes, it was popular music, but it was also somehow, it feels more authentic than a lot of, you know, the things that you'll hear these days, you know, because there's this sense that there's a detachment between the artist and the music, you know, um, that they're simply, um, but, I mean, how, how do you how do you feel about that? Has, has, has popular music kind of gone astray? Because the way that I've heard Frost describe, you know, um, you know, and I, I tend to agree with it is, it's just like, you know, um, kind of like it, it's, it's intelligent music. It's for thoughtful people, music for actual music, you know, all those sorts of things, because it has all of those qualities that I guess is um, depressingly absent at times from a lot of charted music these days. Is, is, is that a, is, is that just me being negative and embittered as a music fan? Um, or, or is there a part of you that, that might agree or, or, or in, indeed disagree with that? Johnson? Well, I think uh, from a, if we're talking about going back to the 80s, uh, I think, you know, that was a time of great discovery. It was like a sort of a renaissance period for music because, of course, this is the first time that sort of technology had appeared to such a, you know, a large degree, you know, um, throughout. I mean, it's the first time that, you, you, you know, you can always listen to a 70s record and know that it's a 70s record. And there was a lot of, you know, quite groundbreaking music in that. I think the trouble is that these days, every, every pretty much a lot of roads have been crossed or, you know, a lot of bridges have been crossed and it's very difficult to be sort of, you know, be a pioneer in any one sort of field of music. So, yeah, I mean, and of course, there was that thing in, in the 80s when, you know, the record companies did still invest time to develop an artist, that less so these days. And, and there was an intrigue and a mystique that I think you know, Gem and I were discussing this, and there's a lot of people making a lot of noise, which is one of the, the messages of day and age. A lot of people transmitting and, and not a lot of receiving going on. And I think the good thing about the 80s, before the advent of social media, was that bands did seem more mysterious and otherworldly. Yeah. And I remember seeing it bites at the Hexagon in Reading when I was 15. And it just like they might as well have come down from Mars. They were so <laughs> bizarre. And you just, that's kind of what, a lot of, I think a lot of what, you know, you, of course, music is cyclical. So you had punk came along and killed off progressive rock, and then grunge came along and killed off hair metal. And you know, but I, you know, I'd rather that my rock star was on the on on the top of a cliff with the wind blowing in his hair than looking like he just filled up somebody's car as a gas station attendant, <laughs> like grunge music did. I think there's nothing mysterious about grunge music, and and that's you know, it lasted all of four or five you know years, and the bands that I suppose you could argue a lot of, I just, I don't know, I like my music to be, you know, it's an, it's a form of escapism listening to music for me. I don't want it to be super realistic and, you know, you know, I want, I want to have emotions tweaked when I listen to it and not for it to be like, you know, I, I just like that thing about David Bowie, you know, he, like Ricky Gervais said once, you know, he, he you know, R David Bowie appeared on top of the pops, you know, in the Starman character. Um, or Ziggy rather, and uh, and you said, oh, D Ricky, your face says, well, look, look, you can do anything, and that's the sort of you know that that's kind of the that's kind of an inspiring thing, and I think a lot of unfortunately, like I said, going back to the, the question, is that in this de um, day and age, um, all 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 roads have been travelled, all bridges have been crossed, and it's very difficult to um, it's very difficult to detach it from the fact that it is just, you know, a lot of it is about the business side of things and, and people, you know, kids, kids running the record labels these days and looking at figures and metrics and going, how can we, you know, and, and, and social media and the whole thing is just kind of in a way being, you know, over scrutinized and sort of devalued in my opinion. Well, I th I, yeah. And I think, yeah, it, that's a really good point. And, and a lot of music these days is, is a and would by forensics. You know, it's well, we need that. That sells well, two, three of them. Okay, they need to put that there. There's a gap in that, but you know, and I think you don't ever really get. I mean, I said this on an interview before. I think the, the era of the superstar is gone. You're never going to get a Prince or a Madonna now. I just don't think it's going to happen because, because there's not, they, they wouldn't be allowed to do that for as long as they were. You know, you wouldn't get a 20 year career arc or a 10 year career. I'd just be like, well, you haven't sold, you're out. You know, that's that first album, you know, it's, it's kind of 
And you can see the immense pressure that people are under. Billie Eilish is a brilliant case in point. She hasn't released any music since that album, as far as I'm aware. Mm. And I think it's because she's probably a bit, bit terrified. Because, you know, how do you, where do I start? I've had an extraordinary success. And she's absolutely ploughed her own furrow. And, and, you know, she's done a brilliant job. And she's, again, I mean, she's kind of the closest thing I would say, because she's this kind of, she came out of nowhere with this thing that no one was doing. And everyone resonated with it, perhaps because everyone was doing everything else. But, you know, that difficult second album syndrome, I wouldn't want to be, I mean, we did that. We made a flight of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Alex and I and John, we talked about this last week. We don't agree with you at all, but that's that's as fans. But uh, yeah. I can't be a fan of uh, something like that. No, no, you're not a fan, but you, you, <laughs> meant, you, you said it exactly the same way. You said that Experiments was, you know... Not as good, whatever it was. And Alex and I completely I said, disagree. I said, but... There was a sense of, like, amongst the fan base, I said, it was a lot of people didn't understand what we were doing or what, you know. You know, I think it's a brilliant album. And, you know. Um, the interesting, well, the interesting thing about it was was it, it really did well at college, American College Rock Radio. It was, it, 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 it was the biggest show we ever had. Wow. And Dream Theater used to play the album in its entirety before they went on for their whole tour that year. <laughs> I almost got the sense that they might have liked us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I yeah. think that didn't come across. <laughs> it does, does, doesn't remind me of that time I was standing in Southampton watching both, you know, you supporting Dream Theatre and the water running down in the rain through that. What a miserable gig that was. But, uh... yeah, on and off stage. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well, yeah. well, we won't go into that. Um, no, no. no, I think with, just as a little tangent with experiments, what the thing about it was actually it, it was a bit of a concept album because it was experiments and mass appeal. You know, it was these songs that were supposed to be more less you know more more focused and and, and we that the, the whole our concept of the frost reports was in that because we were trying to be on telly you know we were kind of weirdly very very early adopters of youtube you know in that respect there wasn't yeah. a lot of people doing that at that point we were quite early on as you can see from the dreadful quality of the videos and i look at the banner but <laughs> but again you know it was all about doing things in a kind of trying to how do you put a prog band in a mainstream environment you know and well obviously you ditch all the keyboards and you ditch all that 20 minute long stuff but of course people they went well i hate this <laughs> yeah, but but let's rewind one album. So you, because you, we talked about you know the the influence of the eighties and so on. Now, Jamie, you've of course been a big player in in the pop game. Let's call it for the, for the sake of anything else. Was Frost a reaction to that? I mean, I've read various things. I've talked talked to you and John about it as well. You know, was because I'm always interested in musicians who are also producers or writers. At what point do you separate your brain into different pieces and say, you know, I'm writing for this audience now, I'm writing, I'm working with that person. It's not what I would do, but I understand that that's where their their direction is. Was Frost just kind of that moment where you said, I want to do the way I want to do it and, and just get it out of your system, initially at least, in 2005, six or so? 2004, wasn't it? Initially, right. yeah, it started in four. It was yeah. well, it started in three actually, but yeah. yes, absolutely. It was, it was. I've, I've been doing sort of five years of pop. Can't complain. We did very well. It was good fun. Not, learned a lot. Met a lot of interesting people and did some very interesting things. But um, again, it, it it is it is like any genre. I mean, this I don't think you have it so much now. But pop then, it is quite a narrow field to work in. And obviously you do one thing in a certain way and everyone goes, oh, can we have lots something like that? So you end up doing the same song effectively like 30 times. And that's the thing about those those sorts of jobs is, is you know, you'll write 40 songs and one will get away. And you've done, you've produced 40 songs, you've made like four albums and no one is ever going to hear them. I've got there's I've got about 150 songs uh, at the univer on the Universal Vault. Nobody will ever hear and I haven't got I haven't got them. I can't hear them. I don't know where I don't know where they are. And I can only it's only vaguely remembering half of what we did. And so, yeah, it was kind of, it was a sense of, you know, I want to control the music I make because I basically deal with this stuff and hand it over and, or, or I never hear it again or, you know, or one in 40 gets away if I'm lucky. So it was just a sort of, a sort of reaction against that. And obviously me being, being a keyboard player as I was, my initial reaction was to go, you know, that's tight, speed tight. So yeah, it kind of, and it was literally at the start of it. I think the first thing I ever wrote for it was the hyperventilate riff, which probably, people probably won't know here, but it's a thing in seven eight. And and now I just left it. I went, went did some, and came back about a month later. And I just oh, cool that, and it just it was accretion, you know, it's a very universal theme. Literally, just little ideas just sort of came together, and 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 then you know, in the end, I sort of went, I've got about seven songs here. Um, and I can't play the guitar, so I got in touch with John. And then he heard it and went, 
you probably should play this to this bloke I know. <laughs> and then that was kind of how it all started. Yeah, so. The, the legend is that you bought a bunch of albums. You'd been out of the prog thing for a while. You bought the albums and said, who's current? Who, who, you know, who's there? Um, is that, is that, it sounds like there was sort of obviously, you know, a, a ripple on of connections as well. Once you talk to one person, they say you need to work with that. But that also must be a, a vindication as well, right? That people didn't immediately say, who are you? What are you doing? Right? Well, they, yeah. well it was, uh, the Atomic Kitten thing did not help me at all. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you. I can tell you. My Lord, the flack I got initially. Um, yeah, it, it, um, I remember some, there was some reviewer went, this is prog for people sitting around the pond, uh, sit, sitting around the pool in, you know, satin suits, drinking, drinking pina coladas. I'm thinking, have you just, right, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and ironically, it's exactly how it was. No, but it, it was, it was, it was <laughs> you know, it was, it was just an assumption. Well, you do that. Therefore this must be rubbish. Yeah. So it was it it was a little bit of a fight to move it forward, but yes, I mean I bought a load of albums from artists, you know, and was just profoundly disappointed because I'd done prog very briefly with this band Freefall with my brother years in the eighties. You know, we we our, our heady height was supporting IQ at the Marquee, I think twice, oh. and then it all went apart. And then I and I'd been out of it for twelve years doing stuff in radio, and I came back and listened to these albums. And I thought, well, it's nothing, isn't it's it's the same. So apart from one album, which was made by that person to my right on the Brady Bunch screen, I could see. <laughs> the Brady Bunch. Oh, yeah. So I think it was, it was like the story you said you were just firing them out of the window of the car down the M1 or whatever it was. I see. I got. I did actually manage to get. There was this where I used to live near Crowbar. There was a bin on a roundabout. I just got quite good at getting them. <laughs> out the so yeah, no, it was it was, and as I say, John John was it, what the, what he was doing was head and shoulders above everybody else. So I emailed him, and he didn't reply to me for twelve weeks. It's mm. <laughs> very true, right? <sorry. laughs> anyway, no, I do remember that, and yes, because I remember thinking, uh, yes, it, it's a uh, who's this chap? Then I thought he was going to be somebody in his bedroom with a four track, and of course, then I t I turned up at Gem's studio, and there's like you know awards and stuff, and I'm going, I have misread this situation. <laughs> <laughs> Greatly, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, you'll you'll have to stop me if I'm wrong. Um, but uh, you know, I I, uh, I remember hearing something that was really amusing, which is that the popularity of Stairway to Heaven, obviously by Led Zeppelin, was down to the fact that uh, radio DJs used to love to play it because it was equal to the length of time it would take to um, smoke a cigarette and go to the bathroom and um, then sit back down again, and so it got almost staggeringly. Uh, blown out of proportion radio planes and, and so I'm always interested in how um, the influence of technology um, you know pans out you know when it comes to recorded music I mean we're all familiar with like LP formats I mean how do you feel about the thought that things like platforms like Spotify for instance the way that the algorithm measures um, you know certain um, beats per minute um, certain kind of chord structures and matches other songs and generates those things is that kind of weird and scary as an artist to think that music is being dissected in that way? Because, um, you know, even in our experience of, you know, placing music on our YouTube channel, um, the ruthless efficiency with which the algorithm can identify music is unbelievable, you know, but it also influences the way that people discover music as well. And, and obviously people are writing all kinds of, well, well, they're recording cover versions, right? Because they want to be inserted into the same algorithms that popular music is. And so they'll record similar things in order to, is that is that all just a bit too much now? Is do we need to kind of push back somehow? Well, um, <laughs> um, obviously not. Obviously not. No, it's all fine. I'm going. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I I, I I do think it's well. It's, do you know what's a strange thing? I mean, I, this is not the, the same thing at all. But you, you know, it, I I'm just before we came on this, uh, we were talking about Richard Branson. And um, uh, and uh, I opened up a browser, and the first thing I saw was, was an interview with Richard Branson. And then the next browser window I went to was talking about Virgin Galactic. And I'm just thinking, that's another strange... I, I, that can't be coincidence, right? Surely. No, I wouldn't have thought so. Anyway, going back to Spotify. Yeah, I do find it odd, but if you like this, then maybe you'll like this. It reminds me, actually, in some ways, it used to make me laugh. Um, when Arena went on tour, we had this Australian merch guy called... Uh, Matt Goodluck, um, 
his name was Goodluck because apparently back in the day, his, his great, great, great grandfather uh, stole a loaf of bread and uh, got sent to Australia. And I think the last thing anybody said to him was good luck or whatever. <laughs> and uh, he's a, on, on entering Australia, that's the name that he gave. And that's apparently a true story. Anyway, <laughs> he used to say, when anybody used to go up to the merch stand at an arena gig, is what's this album like? And he always used to say the same thing. Do you like Pink Floyd? Yeah, well, you like this then. <laughs> <laughs> um, early algorithm. Very early <laughs> algorithm, yeah. Just, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yes, I think it is. It is you know they, the rule of of uh, you know i think the rules again the way that music is is um i think people's attention spans have gone down is one thing i've noticed a, a lot of so many people just you know like i think is 60,000 tracks a day get uploaded to spotify think about that figure for a minute 60,000 new songs every day mm. go up and so how is anybody ever going to get heard and of course you know you know the kids they just you know they they flip through them you know and it, it's it, you, you, you've got to get people's attention quickly um and it's i just know it just feels like a black hole to me this whole mm. uh you know the the devaluation of, of you know popular music or i don't know i don't have a great opinion about the algorithm gem um i mean it's i think it certainly affected our songwriting i mean we've got an album on a track on the new album called island life and that starts with singing straight away <clears throat> And similarly, with the whole start of the album, it starts with hello, which I think if you're skipping through things, you kind of go, oh, although it is part of the theme of it. But I was kind of wanted to have this thing that broke the fourth wall in a way of the music sort of going, I'm talking to you. Hello. You go, oh, yeah, it's a great way. And the fact, you know, thinking about that, literally every program in the history of all programs starts with a big low synth pad. I mean, the, the amount of programs that start like that is re remarkable. And I don't know why, you know, I think it was a, that, that was, I love that. Well, I remember when Jem played that to me first of all. Yes, that's how you start an album. Mm. It's yeah, the algorithm. I mean, it, if I don't know, it, 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 music, I don't think, well, you've alluded to this earlier. Um, I just don't think music is as valued as it was. You know, I think mm. it's something that you have in the background. And actually, for a lot of people, it sort of is anyway. You go to a cafe and it's on the radio, it's in the background, or, you know, you're going such. I mean, for some people, it is just some sort of nice sound in the background, you know, because silence freaks people out it would appear yeah and that's true and uh you know I, I, there's I, there'll always be passionate people i mean I, on, the, on the other heart on the other side of that uh, argument actually i've got to say i've di i've discovered some amazing bands on spotify that i wouldn't have found absolutely With, without the if you like this you like that so yeah. I, it's 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 difficult it's a really difficult one yeah for, for me actually I, I am the same i mean definitely spotify has brought things up but i used to like listening to late junction when i lived in the uk i thought it was a fantastic radio show yeah, for yeah. you know because it was completely eclectic and yet it had been curated by a human being not by a computer um so let's because you know we're kind of running out of time but let's actually talk about the new album let's go through them so million town in a way kind of you know big sprawling progressive piece uh uh an album it's not really a concept album at least not to me but there's some big pieces and some shorter bits uh, experiments in mass appeal we both dissed that well I don't agree but there you go uh, but at least what I do think I about experiments that. is that it, 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 it for me it's a loop I mean I think that the, it, the album st you know at the end of the album if you go back to the beginning again it all is a circle uh, there seems to be at least some kind of loop and that I think at least the way I've got it set up on my um, you know the, the way I listen to it same is true of day and age I think I mean it seems to loop yeah. you go right out of the back end of it it starts right and you know you have it on your iPhone it starts immediately without a beat back at the beginning again and it's looped that way so again that comes back to this whole business about algorithms right if you only hear one song you miss the sprawl but let's before we talk about day and age I do want to use the opportunity I want to abuse the opportunity to ask about falling satellites um, because that's the third album and it came after you very kindly, a pair of you, uh, let us use uh, the instrumental version of Saline on that video of the Philae probe descending down to Comet 67P in 2014-15. Um, I love to think that the name of the album was inspired in 2016 by that falling satellite. It probably wasn't, but I'm going to put you on the spot. So this is your chance to tell me I'm wrong, Jim. You're wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> um... <laughs> So, well, Salon was from experiments, so yeah, uh, yeah. But it, I think with, with uh, Falling Satellites, it's actually, it's about, it was, I, I said this before, it's my midlife crisis album. It is about the trajectory of the human life. 
So, you know, you start and it's all, power, you're all young and fabulous and brilliant, brilliant, and your career's going, you're earning more and more money, it's all brilliant, brilliant. Oh, no, it's all going to happen, you're getting really old, everything's falling apart. And it's kind of that, basically. Yeah. That was, the, that was the, the story arc. And it just happened when my dad died. Yeah. And it was very much, weirdly, it became about sort of, a, it, I suddenly saw a, a whole life because we had the whole, you know, the, the service and the celebrum saying this and Peter doing this and that. And, you know, there's, there's bits in it. It, yeah, it, it sort of it starts off numbers. Numbers is about um, uh, it's actually about the stag. I mean, I, I said I wasn't going to discuss what songs about, but <laughs> this is about. It's about the staggering improbability of ever being conceived. So the whole song, the whole album, really kind of goes through this sort of you know, and Tavlock's bad childhood thing, and it, you know, and it, it kind of, and then there's it sort of lights out. It's sort of about something else. that's quite dark, and it just so basically it kind of just goes through to, to to sort of the end of. You know, the end of life. Hyperventilate obviously is is hypoxia, and there's a very slow heartbeat in the back of it. It's all it's all kind of it's all about a life, really. Yeah. And then and then so day and age. You know, again we we come we got we got there in the end. Um, <laughs> um, again, we we obviously can't ask you what it's all about, but again, it, it it does seem to me a very cyclic thing, and there are obviously there. Are th musical themes which pop up here and there and um there are voices which i'm not entirely sure whether they're all um you know we've got jason isaacs who ended up uh um doing a narration for you and i i just love it thank i think you. it's a, thank a, you for that thank well no not at all i mean it's just a pleasure to be able to hook, hook this kind of space rocks thing up there that was brilliant um and I have no idea where he is. I mean, I keep sending him emails. He's off being a film star somewhere, but I'll, I'll get in touch with him at some point. Um, I, there's Donald Trump in there briefly. I wish you hadn't done that because I can't listen to the album without having <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> so, um, but it's of its time. And I think that's what I wanted to say as well. So, you know, you, I knew you'd, you'd started writing it before the lockdown. Um, and it was written in two locations, or at least the pair of you came together, one in kind of bucolic Cornwall or down well you, you kept hiding where the hell it was no I'm not sure I know where it is even now we didn't want to get burgled that week that was all we just <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the bit at Dungeness where no burglars will go because it's too close to a nuclear reactor so it kind of in a way it spans the music writing spans the two extremes of our modern day and age in some way I'm not sure if I'm putting too much into that but how much did it change during last year as it as it came together the album you mean yeah, so I mean, uh, I mean the, well, the songs were written, but did you sort of feel the need to link them in some way to reflect the changed world we were in, or was it already locked in? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I can hand over to my my great rock colleague, because he was he was the driving force behind many of the lyrics in this album. So it, it kind of, um, uh, what, John? <laughs> well, I've got to, we'll talk about one song, because, um, you know, we just as an example of, of, of um, you know, our thought process was actually that... Um, yeah, but first and foremost, I was going to answer the question about when we when we uh, recorded in Dungeness and wrote songs, and we we became about sixty percent more gloomy. <laughs> <laughs> it got it all got very uh, yeah, it all got very sort of um, yeah, it was it's it bleak, <laughs> and that's where we had the song repeat to fade that that uh, and terrestrial came from from that um, from that particular writing session, and we did actually write another couple. I think there was at least another one that we did that that session. But you know, not everything gets used, and and uh, that's as it should be. You know, you. you know, nothing, you know. Um, but certainly, I remember, for example, um, when we um, Island Life, right? So originally, um, can we we can we can talk? Yeah. Oh, I'll go on then. Oh, go on then. <laughs> Only one song. Um, yeah. Originally, we, we, I, Alex and I know already. But anyway, well, you know okay. already. Right, yeah. so there's a there's an island north of Russia called Novaya Zemlya. Which is a, a, a vast landmass, and uh, yeah, it's it's famous for two things. Um, it's got a prison there where they send um, naughty people, um, and it's also famous for nuclear testing. And um, I just I kind of imagine the fact that well, you're going to get sent there, you're probably not going to live much longer because it's so irradiated, um, and that's kind of where the, the basis of the song came about. But then. As we went on, um, I think uh, we, you know, and the lyrics kind of took on a different meaning. It became, you know, because I remember a friend of mine, uh, Chris Perrin, many, many years ago. He said something to me. You know, songs are never really about one thing, one thing, unless you're so turbo literal about what you're writing about. But we kind of came to realise actually, you know, um, it is, it is, it, it is, um, 
it became kind of almost about um, so there's certain elements of it that, that there are uh, allude to the fact of the island that we do live on, you know, and it's uh, and the state that we find ourselves in. So it's kind of a you know, it's it, it started out in in my mind meaning one thing and then meaning something entirely different. I mean, it's it's interesting that you know we've actually titled the uh, episode of Uplink, you know, uh, music for time traveling, obviously, because of course you know in a way I guess any album is a distillation of a moment in time, right? Or at least the moment in time that you've committed everything, and it's, I guess it's off to the presses, uh, you know, in any sense. And and it's interesting how you also talk about how your perspective on that music might change over oh, time. Totally. You know, totally. I mean, I, sorry to interject there, Alex, but I just, you know, I think John Beck uh, said to me once, you know, albums are never finished. They're just abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, yeah, well, that's because he's the sort of person that can never stop fiddling. But of course, you know, there there comes a point when you realise actually this is as close as I want to get it. But at the same time, as Gem and I have discussed in the past, you know, People always ask, did you did you bring anything over from like you know from a, a writing session there or did, did you, from the last time? Well, it's kind of like, you know, it is very uh, sort of time linear in a way that you don't feel the same way about something when you, you know, it, it, it is like it is like keeping a diary in a strange way, and so you wouldn't you know recycle your diary from how you were feeling about something you know in way back when you know, in 2012 or whatever. Mm. So, you know, I, I like the, I like that, the, the fact that when you start an album and we, we didn't bring anything to the table when we, when we went down to Cornwall, it is not like, Hey, I've got this riff from 2007. It was none of that. It was just like completely fresh canvas and off we went. And I really do like that, you know, right? <laughs> Hey, John. Yeah. Cause that's how we talk. That Kit Kat advert. Okay. <laughs> riff. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. You go, you're going to go a long way. <laughs> Of course, I'm going to cut you on the bullshit now because there is a a very special chunk for at least for the Frost fans out there. The yeah, Frosties. I was going to say this. Yeah. I was just going to raise. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, so what? Why did why did you pick up 1976 and use it here? It's a beautiful piece. We all wanted, you know, it was amazing to hear it the first time. But well, it was. I mean, obviously, the, the time traveling thing, brilliant, and it's 1976, which is brilliant. Well, I'd like to say that I wrote that before the band the 1975 existed. I just want to say that. <laughs> it's the same way, I came up with an idea for an album called. Uh, Oh, six minutes in September, and then there was a band Five Seconds of Summer, and that one as well. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, it was it was it was a bit I'd always really liked. You know, it was from the experiment session, so it was about two thousand and yeah. nine, eight, seven, maybe. Eight. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 one of those, I tinkered with it and I changed it, and I, you know, and every every couple of years I listened back to this other thing. Oh, there's something about that, but I could never make it work. And then I was just working on the man, uh, uh, the boy who stood still. And um, and it just was, I said, hang on a minute. It's, I think it was, the original was a semitone higher. But um, uh, but yeah, so I just kind of went, that would work actually. And because I'd been trying all these different bits. So I grabbed it and grabbed all the bits and chucked it in, knocked it down a semitone and went, well, I'll open. <clears throat> were you aware that it was a huge fan favorite? It kind of became, it kind of got some leg, semi-legendary status at some point. Yeah, it was. It was, it was a little bits of it released on sort of outtakes and so on. That whole and that well, that whole song is 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 time travelly because there's the guitar riff in it is actually uh, the Black Light Machine guitar riff through uh, Melodyne. What? What? <laughs> <clears throat> so okay. there's a whole kind of it's a whole sort of it was it was it's and it's all about the passage of time and you know and all that, so it's all supposed to be a little bit of a kind of a little nod. Wheels the- within wheels. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, there you go. Well, thank you for thank you for that. It's, it's 1976, big, for, you know, and it, it sort of uh, as I said, and when I heard it, I was going, "Uh, is that is that? Yeah. Oh, oh, you know, it's but it, horribly fanboy geeky stuff. So you know, but uh, we in the future, all new, please, none of that mucking around with the past. But but just one thing I did want <laughs> one thing I did want to say is myself, haven't I? <laughs> you 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 are at the moment also you you. You've reworked some of the albums um, over the, over time, and am I right? Million Towns now available on vinyl. Not that I'm a vinyl freak at all, but uh, it is. Yeah, yes, yeah. it is. Apparently. And is that? I mean, let me be honest. Is that sort of pandering to a market, or is there something there that you felt it, it would work out, better? Inside out of vinyl freaks. They're the vinyl okay. freaks. They're absolutely obsessed with vinyl. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I bought the vinyl of Day and Age. It'll never be played, so I'll probably get rich in fifty years' time if I can live that long because I, I, I don't have a turntable, but. Uh, very pretty it is. Vinyl, yeah, I don't know. It, it, John, John's your vinyl man. I, I'm with you on that one, Mark. I'm afraid I have about 2% interest in it. 
<laughs> we just know one thing about vinyl is increasingly long lead times to manufacture it. So, um, you know, and everyone gets very obsessed about we've got to have the album by this date. This out it has this is the this is the deadline because then we, that allows us enough time to do the vinyl. And when you think about it, actually the amount of, of vinyl units you actually sell compared to the amount of you know, digital downloads or CDs is quite negligible, but at the same time, for some reason, it has this sort of Holy Grail-esque nature to it, and it's of some great import, which is funny, because I, I remember when they re removed the, the vinyl section from uh, uh, the uh, the HMV in Reading. Well, no, was it? No, there was it used to be a thing in the Sainsbury Superstore in Calcott, and all of one day, all the vinyl disappeared, and I said, bye-bye, vinyl, and now, you, now you, here it is again. Like the bad penny. <laughs> I mean, again, I mean, actually, funny. I was just thinking about this now. Well, I might rather try it. Reply just then. But actually, I mean, again, on the time traveling theme, it is a little bit of. As, I mean, I have helped. You know, obviously, I looked at the Dono's vinyl, and I did have a little tiny inkling of of looking at the out of the blue vinyl, the ELO double album, yeah. about seventy seven, and having that same thing. Okay, what's all this? And what's going on? And look at you know, it's all big. And so maybe there is an element of it to that. You know, there is. It kind of in my respect. In my respect, I did have a little tinge of a connection to like young me. Mm. Um, <laughs> but in terms of playing it, no, I've no idea how I'm going to do that. Yeah, no. In terms of Carl's lovely artwork, it certainly is a good. It's a good uh, sort of shop front for that, isn't yeah. it? I suppose. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a good pitch as well, Jim. Because you you know we haven't really. I think they're almost sort of the forgotten prog band, aren't they? ELO. I mean, you've you've covered one of their songs at least, and. Uh, I remember again. I was sixteen at the time. I bought Out of the Blue, and it was this big thing, and you just opened it up, and it was, you know. And it, but I've, you know, it's a strange thing about the music because some of the gigs that were done recently, you look at the audience there, and it's just a bunch of people like me, you know, fifty-five year old, sixty year old. And I, I, do you think ELO have kind of been lost somewhere? That they're a pure nostalgia band now. Is that is that fair? I mean, I'm not really sure where to put them anymore. They are. There we are. I mean, well, we've got a. There's, we have a link in that the bass player is Lee Pomeroy, long time yeah. in the band. But he's he. They. Uh, I always loved him. John was never a fan. No. I know that. Um, and I, what I liked about it again was was it was kind of it was all. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of like all the sort of there's reversed things and sort of sort of production tricks, vocals going backwards, little secret messages hidden and stuff. And I, I love all that kind of attention to detail. Um, but, you know, I was listening back the other day to some of their stuff, and actually a lot of it is just blues. And I didn't realise it at the time. Mm. Mm. And it's kind of, you know, I, I sort of suddenly realised that. And then they would, they'd have a bit in the middle that was all mad and, all, and you know, backward strings and people going, whoa. And it, and, but, but a lot of it was 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 sort of 12-bar stuff, but I still it still worked. You know, I think a lot of that was done. Again, for me, um, Richard Tandy, the keyboard player, is a massive, massive, massive fan of his. Yeah. Uh, one of the weirder gigs I've ever been to. I never saw them at the time, unfortunately. But um, we have big telescopes. A European a place called the European Southern Observatory has huge telescopes in the Chilean desert. Uh, you fly into Santiago. You fly up to Antofagasta, which is this mining town where it never rains. It's just, it's, well, I, mean, I don't want to insult anybody, but it's not a really very nice place because it's so dry that any bit of rubbish that gets thrown out just lives forever and tire tracks across the desert. So we call and it a dust bowl. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's just no water. Any water comes in from the Andes by pipeline. There's nothing there, but it's a port, and that's a great way of getting all the copper out, um, which is mined inland. Anyway, then you go back down and you drive to the mountains in the Atacama Desert and these big telescopes, which is amazing. But we had the, the opening symposium for those telescopes was held in Antofagasta, and it must have been around 99 or 2000. And so a whole bunch of astronomers troop down there to sort of celebrate, talk about the science that's being enabled by these telescopes. And we were having lunch and there was a piece of paper on the table and it said, you know, tomorrow night in Antofagasta, ELO. And we're thinking, <laughs> what? Come on, tribute band or something. No, it was. It was ELO 2 without Jeff Lynne. Uh, so, well, but it had Bev Bevan and it had, I think Richard Tandy was in ELO 2, Kelly it Gruco. Cool. It was mo. I don't. It wasn't. Wasn't John Payne or something? No, they had somebody like there was a, some strange connection. I'll have to look it up, and I've got you know I've got the flyer somewhere. And then we went, you know, because a bunch of us at my generation we were ELO fans, and we went. It was this metal shed on the outskirts of Antofagasta in the middle of the Chilean desert, and there were just people going nuts. I mean, it was amazing. It was completely yeah, full. That was a new booking agent. <laughs> yeah. But I think they folded. That was their last tour, the ELO oh, tour, yeah. at that point. I think so. But but I yeah, just in a like weird way. 
do want to tell you a very quick story that, about Jeff Lynn, which made me laugh out loud. I, um, obviously, Jeff Lynn is, is quite the um, analog man. Um, and I think to this day, he still records on, on two inch tape. Um, I'm given to understand. But a number of years ago now, Ampex, the company that used to manufacture two inch tape, um, or the main uh, suppliers of that, they went bust and they had the big sort of uh, sort of um, going closing down sale, as it were. And I think, from what I understand, um, Jeff Lynn got on the, got his people to get on the phone to Ampex and say, "Look, can I buy your remaining stock, please? You know, I just, you know, I, I everything you've got, I'll take it. You know, sort of future proofing his career, as it were. Or, you know, um, and then of course uh, uh, Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, who, who equally loves analog tape, got wind of this transaction <laughs> going down and got in touch with Ampex and said. Can I buy all your remaining stock, please? And they're like, no, we've just sold it to Jeff Lynn, I'm afraid. Uh, Jeff's got it all. And then Dave Grohl got in touch with Jeff Lynn and said, any chance I can buy some? No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, I, I just a amusing story. Fantastic. Well, uh, on that bombshell, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I've got to say, well, we're uh, we're rolling up toward um, the, uh, the end of, uh, I guess, what could be considered a, a well, a brilliant episode of Uplink um, and so many more questions to be asked. But there is a final one that I have to on behalf of everyone who's watching, which is, Jem, where does one get a TARDIS? I can tell you, you get a TARDIS from a company called thisplanetearth.co.uk. Okay, that's a plug right there. Fantastic. You can buy every police box from every doctor's era. You can buy all sorts of Daleks. You can buy Cybermen. You can buy K9, you can buy premium Ice Warriors, all licensed by the BBC, and they are all there. Wow, this is incredibly valuable information. All right, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I can imagine you're running around in your Cyberman pajamas, getting in, you know, pu 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 pulling the uh, Sarah Jane quilt over, you know, let's, let's not go there. <laughs> Uh, that's that's you, Mark. I'm afraid that's. Uh, I think it's my. That's, that's, that's yeah. Sorry. Uh, can we can we edit that bit, Alex? Can we cut that piece? Out? No, no, no. Mark's got his frost underpants. Definitely. <laughs> I'll put my frost beanie on and my Sarah Jane quilt. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, Jam and John, um, I feel like uh, we could just uh, uh, chat with you guys for hours, and so we're going to have to invite you back to a future episode, and uh, yeah, perhaps find ways to collaborate uh, with actual in-person events as well, um, you know, as, uh, as that becomes possible, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, on behalf of everyone at Space Rocks, thanks so much for joining us today. And before you go, uh, we have a bit of a tradition and Mark, tradition <coughs> dictates it falls to you. And uh, John, I'm afraid your cat's gonna have to do it as well now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my cat's out there somewhere at the moment. <clears throat> so yeah, just stupid thing. I'm, I, I often wonder whether I'm regretting ever thinking up this idea in the first place. But we like to sign off with a bit of a uh, sort of sci-fi, oh, wrong one. You see, I'm, I'm out of the loop here. Jeez, what, I'm having a bad day. So this is space. This is the Vulcan salute, live long and prosper. And this is rocks. So, Jem, you're on the spot now, because I think John may have practiced this. Is this, a ah, look at that, genius. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, guys, thank you so much. I, you, you guys have done this. I've, uh, you wouldn't believe how embarrassing it was to ask two Nobel Prize winners to do that. Who are friends of mine. So, <laughs> no, you know, I can. I can. You can. You can. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed asking you at all, but that's, that's, for, another, that's for another time. <laughs> yeah. Guys, uh, thanks so much for your time today. And thank you for the wonderful music as well. What a pleasure it's been to share some ideas. And um, we do hope to reconnect again soon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Same for me, guys. Look, you've been in hugely important part of my musical you know i don't know whatever it is the thing the life and i hope that we can get to see uh, day and age performed live sooner rather than later we are working on it watch this space thanks very good see you soon bye guys thank you well then mark uh, i genuinely felt like that was uh, the definition of a fireside hangout um you could <laughs> say um what intelligent people and i guess it just kind of goes to show that uh, while so much is made of the people on stage, the people off stage are just as interesting. And and John, who we know so well, and Jem, who um, I've only met for this episode, um, just have so much to say as people as well as musicians. Yeah, look, I, I apologize to everybody if I've kind of been a bit fanboy and a bit gushy, but you know, they they, they are just right up there for me as a as a band. 
and, and Jem alluded to it, it's not only the music, it's the thought that goes into the music. Yeah, it's a little bit of the technology, which I'm kind of you know interested in in other ways, but also the humour. I mean, if, if you do want to go back and look at some of those YouTube videos about this band and how they made their previous albums, and you, maybe it's demystifying the whole process, but for me, it humanised the process and... Uh, being able to meet them and uh, well I know I'll, I'll say it now that Jem's off the line but you know there was a time when I was sort of saying come on come and do something with the European Space Agency and Jem was going who is this bloke you know why why, why are we talking to him but uh, yeah it's been a huge pleasure talking to them and uh, having them on Uplink this evening indeed and as ever a pleasure to be joined by you as well thanks so much to uh, everybody who joined us um, for this episode um, do go to spacefoxofficial.com and sign up for our newsletter and receive news of our upcoming uplinks. And uh, Mark, as ever, an absolute pleasure to spend this time with you. Thanks so yeah. much. Thank you, Alex. See you all soon, everybody. Bye-bye.